the quality of your life is largely determined by the quality of your communications. In all successful relationships, the partners will always say that they communicate extremely well. And wherever communications break down or slow down or don't take place, you start to have problems. And one of the keys to effectiveness in the world of work is your ability to communicate, to communicate effectively and well. In fact, even if you work in technical fields like computer programming or engineering, you spend as much as 75% of your time communicating and interacting with other people. So your effectiveness as a person is determined by your effectiveness in getting your message across and in getting the message clearly that the other person is sending. And by the way, there's two forms of communications. The first form is your interpersonal communications, the way you talk to yourself and dialogue with yourself and think and plan to yourself. And the other form of communications is the way you interact with others. And of course, one affects the other. And wonderfully enough, how to communicate is a learned skill. And you can get better and better at it by learning what the best communicators do and practicing it until it becomes a regular part of your repertoire. Number one, there are three elements to any conversation. A, words only account for 7% of the message. When you talk, it's only 7% is the words. That's why they say in speaking, people will forget most of what you say, but they will remember the way you said it. And B is the tone of voice. The mere tone of your voice accounts for fully 38% of your message. And if you're on the phone, it counts for almost 80% of your message, maybe even more. When you want to sound friendly, warm, reassuring, intimate, or caring when you speak, keep your voice in the lower range where the deeper sounds are. The lower to middle tones are also great when you want to reason with the other person or show that you care or that you're being thoughtful. Also, remind yourself to slow down. It's very difficult to be close, friendly, warm, or thoughtful when you're speaking too quickly. Most of us tend to slow down naturally when we're expressing our deeper emotions, uh, except for maybe anger. And when you slow it down, your voice tones actually drop and it becomes lower and more gentle. Powerful people, by the way, deliberately speak more slowly and with lower tones. They slow it down and they pause. And this gives their words power and people pay more attention to them. Women, by the way, are very sensitive to tones of voice and to very tiny changes in tones of voice. How many men have heard this? I know I have. When I said, well, I just said this, she said, it's not what you said. It's your tone of voice. So. Tone of voice is important, and that's why we need to give some thought to it, because if we're in a hurry or busy or rushed, sometimes our tone of voice can be clipped or short, and it can be hurtful. C is body language accounts for fully 55% of your communication. And the rule is that people believe the dominant message. What message is dominant? For example, if you say, well, do you love me? Yeah, sure, I love you. Do people believe the words or the dominant message, which is the body language and the tone of voice? But if you say, yes, I love you, then they believe the totality. And that's why the very best message is a message that is synchronized. The words, the tone of voice, and the body are all synchronized to the message. Very important. That's why when somebody talks to you, it's important you turn toward them and face them directly when you talk to them and listen closely to what they say and nod and pay attention. That's very important than saying, yeah, I'm listening, over the back of your shoulder. I was reading a book yesterday about a woman who was very, very unhappy because her husband never gave her any indication that he loved her and supported her because he was always watching television. And you ask the husband, he said, sure, I love her. I think she's the most important person in the world. Well, then why don't you spend time with her? Well, I do. I'm in the house all the time. I come home after work every night. Well, no, that's not how women measure love. So the most important thing in your relationships with your, with your spouse and with your children is FaceTime. There's a great book called uh, His Needs, Her Needs. And they talk about the 10 major needs that men have and the 10 major needs that women have alternating back and forth. And all women know what man's first need is, so let's talk about hers. And her first need is for attention, affection, and respect. Face to face, eye to eye, heart to heart, knee to knee, attention, affection, and respect. Those are the biggest need. And if she gets those needs fulfilled, then everything else will be fine. If she does not get those needs fulfilled, she's going to be unhappy. 
And men think, well, geez, I'm in the same house. I'm watching TV. No, the only time you are actually with your, the woman in your world is when you're face to face and giving them attention and listening to them when they talk and giving them affection and respect. Uh, so, so FaceTime and there's a one to one relationship between how much FaceTime you spend and what quality of life you have. So it's really important that you don't have FaceTime accidentally. You plan it, you schedule it, you organize, and the busier you are, the more you have to make appointments. Well, number two, there are three parts of any conversation. A, the first part of conversation is ethos. Ethos has to do with the character of the person. A person who has high character can say little and be enormously influential. B is pathos. Pathos is the second part of communication. It means connecting with the emotions. And we connect with the emotions when we tune in and focus in on the person and their problems and their needs. Always remember people are carrying a heavy load. And I think it's an interesting thing when you consider that we have problems, but so many other people have vastly greater problems than us. And when you tune in to other people's problems and concerns, it's amazing how much better your life is. And C is logos, is the factual content of the conversation. And the factual content is often the least important. But until you have established character and connected with the emotions of the other person, the words you say, the argument, is really not relevant. In selling, what do we say? In selling, you establish rapport, which is the character. You seek the underlying problem or need, which is connecting with the pathos, and only then do you talk about your product or service, which is the logos. And in dealing with anybody in, in life, it's those three. Number three is there are four basic personality styles. The first is who we call relators. The relator is very high on people orientation and indirect. They are quiet, self-contained, not particularly expressive. They're sensitive, people-oriented, and concerned about other people's opinions. Now, in the extreme, a relator will be hypersensitive to the opinions of others. They can't do anything without making sure that everybody else approves. They have to talk with everybody before they make a decision. If you're communicating, this person requires slow, low-key, easygoing, friendly, almost warm and fuzzy. So if you're dealing with relators, you have to go slow and you have to be patient. You can't be pushy because they like time to make decisions. and They need time to talk to other people. Their greatest concern in life is, let's get along, Let, let's all be friends. Relators tend to gravitate toward fields where relators are most effective. So you find relators in fields like nursing, social services, teaching, small child development, psychology, personnel, or counselors where they relate to other people. Now the next type of person is the analyzer. Now the analyzer is indirect and self-contained, but very task-oriented. This is the kind of person who is not so much concerned about people, but more concerned about doing the job and are more inward directed. This type of person at the extreme can be an uncommunicative bureaucrat, very meticulous and picky about every detail. Their primary concern is, let's be accurate. They only feel comfortable when the numbers and the details are correct. The analyzer, who is fastidious and detail oriented, wants accuracy and just the facts. Now, where do you think they'll gravitate to in terms of work? Well, they'll gravitate toward accounting, computers, engineering, bookkeeping, computer programming, any field where the problems don't talk back. When you're dealing with an analyzer, concentrate on giving them lots of detail because this is what makes them comfortable with a decision. Now, the third type of person is what we call the director. The director, these people are bottom line oriented, impatient. They make quick decisions and they don't need a lot of detail. They're most concerned with let's get results, get to the bottom line, cut to the chase. The fourth type of personality is what we call the socializer. And sometimes they're called expressive. They have to express themselves a lot. The socializer is outgoing, direct, voluble, and very people oriented. This person's primary motivation is achievement and achievement with and through other people. They like to talk about achievement. What are you doing? How did you do it? How did it work? Let me tell you what I did and how it worked for me. Many times they become managers or executives because they have highly integrated personalities. They're very concerned about results, but they're also concerned about people. They have both a strong focus on people 
and a very strong focus on achievement and getting things done. Now, everybody you meet is in one of these four quadrants or groups. The mistake that most people make is that they treat everyone else as if they were just the same as they were. If you're in sales, by the way, you will miss three quarters of your potential prospects because you treat them all the way you are. However, no matter which style of communicator you are, three quarters of the people you meet are something else. Now, there's no right or wrong, better or worse style. These are almost born into people. You can see them in children from an early age. However, your job in asking questions and listening to people is to find out which style they are and then to practice personality flexibility so that you can get along with a greater number of different types of people. Okay, number four is a balanced dialogue. A balanced dialogue means no monopolizing. The very best conversations are conversations that have an ebb and flow like the tide. Go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. There's an easy, relaxed flow back and forth. And if the people are together for 10 minutes or 10 hours, the conversation goes back and forth. There's a thing called the conversation test. And it is a test of the compatibility of two people. We know that in the ideal conversation, each person will get a chance to talk and each person will get a chance to listen. And by the way, each of us have needs like vitamin and mineral needs to talk and each of us have needs to listen. What can often happen, however, is some people will have 70% of the time they need to talk. And the other person, 70% of the time they need to talk. And so they're always clashing because they're both trying to get their talking out. The worst of all is when incompatibility sets in in a relationship and both of them only need to talk 10 or 15% of the time. And then there's vast gaps of uncomfortable silence. This is where the two people really don't have very much in common anymore. They don't have much to say. When they come together, they come together, they usually have an easy ebb and flow, but over time kind of dries up. Have you ever seen a couple driving along in a car? Both of them look straight ahead. Nobody says anything. Or they sit in a restaurant and they eat and they don't say anything. Not a good sign. Number five key to communication is to question for clarification. Never assume that you understand what the other person is saying or trying to say. Instead, if you have any doubt at all, ask, how do you mean? Or, how do you mean exactly? And then just pause and wait. This is the most powerful question I've ever learned for guiding and controlling a conversation. It's almost impossible not to answer this question. When you ask, how do you mean? The other person cannot stop himself or herself from answering more extensively. You can then follow up with other open-ended questions and keep the conversation rolling along. And sometimes people are shy, and I can tell you this, the way that you overcome your shyness is very simply this. Tune into the other person, ask questions, and then listen carefully to the answers. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Get out of yourself and don't be preoccupied with what the other person is thinking about you. Instead, focus on encouraging the other person to talk about them. The more the person is talking about themselves, the more they like you. In fact, I'll give you a secret for success in life. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. When you go home at night, don't talk about your day at all. Instead, ask her and ask the kids about their days and listen closely and ask them follow-up questions and probe. Number six is acknowledge and agree good conversationalists are active conversationalists. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yes, uh-huh, yeah, oh, that's, that's, uh -huh, that, that's really, look at that, that, good. They're there. They're not sitting there passively like fence posts. They're actually engaged. So active listening is very, very important in relationships. Active listening means the person is really there. Put down the magazine or newspaper, turn off the television set, lean in, be there the whole time. Number seven, listen attentively. When you listen intently to another person and it's clear that you genuinely care about what that other person is saying, his or her self-esteem goes up. When you listen, his or her feeling of personal value increases. He or she feels more worthwhile and important as a human being. 
you can actually make another person feel terrific about himself or herself by listening in a warm, genuine, caring way to everything he or she has to say. Listening builds self-esteem in the person who is being listened to. Now, the opposite of listening is ignoring. You always listen to that or who you most value. You always ignore that which you devalue. The fastest way to turn a person off, to hurt their feelings, and to make them feel slighted and angry is to simply ignore what they are saying or interrupt them in the middle of a thought. Ignoring or interrupting is the equivalent of an emotional slap in the face. Men especially have to be careful about their natural desire to make a remark or an observation in the middle of a conversation, especially when talking to a woman. The reason why listening is such a powerful tool in developing the art and skill of conversation is because listening builds trust. The more you listen to another person, the more he or she trusts you and believes in you. Number eight is for you to paraphrase the speaker's words in your own words. So after you've nodded and smiled, you can then say, well, let me see if I got this right, or let me see if I understand you exactly. What you're saying is this, and then you repeat it back in your own words. By paraphrasing the speaker's words, you demonstrate in no uncertain terms that you are genuinely paying attention and making every effort to understand his or her thoughts or feelings. Remember, when you can paraphrase what the person said, this is the real test of listening. This is where you really prove that you are really listening. Number nine is pause before replying. A short pause of three to five seconds after a person stops talking is a very classy thing to do in a conversation. When you pause, you accomplish three goals simultaneously. First, you avoid running the risk of interrupting if the other person is just catching his or her breath before continuing. The second benefit is that you show the other person that you are giving careful consideration to his or her words by not jumping in with your own comments at the earliest opportunity. The third benefit of pausing in conversation is that you will actually hear the other person better. His or her words will soak into a deeper level of your mind and you will understand what he or she is really saying with greater clarity. By pausing, you mark yourself as a brilliant conversationalist.